Welcome to this afternoon's um, session on brutalism, uh, in which we're going to explore the idea that brutalism is making a comeback. Uh, indeed, this came to my attention. Um, I'm Michael Owens from Bow Arts Trust, and uh, I'll introduce the panel in a second. It came to my attention uh, in 2014 when we ran an arts festival in a tower block in East London uh, designed by Erno Goldfinger. And we found that, um, first of all, the British Council were really interested in joining in and bringing architects from around the world uh, to come and spend time in Poplar and East London. And indeed, the National Trust in London was so excited about this brutalist building that they came and opened up one of the flats and made it the centerpiece of their summer um, practice. So I thought that was pretty good. It, uh, it excited our, uh, our festival. But then uh, next year, uh, I was to find that the National Trust were doing the same thing on the South Bank uh, and the year after uh, the same kind of theme, but now down in Croydon. So if you have an unpopular part of town, uh, as we had in Poplar East London, discover your brutalist building and you will excite interest. And I think that that message uh, in Croydon I've mentioned, but most recently I think Thamesmead uh, are getting into that kind of practice. So just from the point of view of the sort of the news value uh, and, the, and the cultural atta attachment, it does seem to me uh, the brutalism, the B word, is indeed big news. So uh, I'm really interested to hear uh, from the experts that we have here today uh, what they think about um, the, you know, whether this is simply a style trend of the moment or whether there is something much more substantial uh, that we ought to recollect and reinvigorate in practice today. Just to introduce our guests today, so Dr. Barnabas Calder uh, on my immediate left, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Liverpool School of Architecture uh, and has just issued a book which I really urge you to buy, uh, Raw Concrete, The Beauty of Brutalism. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, Barnabas' specialism <laughs> is British architecture since 1945 uh, and he encourages you to focus on his new book, if you're inspired today. Um, Lucy, um, you needed Lucy to find this room because Lucy is the assistant venue manager here at the Barbican Centre and indeed runs the Barbican Architecture Tours. Lucy has a, an, a, an MA in architecture history that she got at UCL. Okay, Sebastian uh, Massa is senior lecturer at Northumbria, Northumbria University uh, and is also a char chartered architect. As well as being an academic, uh, Sebastian is a practitioner and has practiced architecture in the Northeast in Newcastle uh, and Gateshead. Um, he studied at the Macintosh School of Architecture in Glasgow and also down here in London at the Bartlett School uh, of UCL. Then um, next we'll have Penny Lewis. Uh, Penny Lewis is a, a lecturer up in Scotland at the, uh, at the Sutherland School of Architecture, part of the Robert Gordon University in Dundee. Uh, and Penny's also the co-founder of the Foundation for Architecture and Education, uh, in which she uh, writes, speaks, and organizes uh, around critical thinking in architecture. And then finally on the panel we have John, John McRae, uh, who is the co-owner of Orms. Uh, and uh, I know Orms because they've designed a whole number of offices uh, across London, uh, but you will find John's work uh, right across the, uh, the piece in terms of the, the, the sectors that he engages in. And John's uh, passion, uh, he says on the Orms website, is about uh, an architecture that listens, an architecture that listens. So if we listen to brutalism as a, as a theme, uh, I wonder what we'll hear. So I'm going to ask uh, my panellists to say uh, something up to five minutes by way of introduction. I have to be uh, fairly, uh, fairly strict with you, I'm afraid. Uh, but then we'll immediately open it up to the audience. Okay, so first of all, Barnabas. Thank you. Uh, I'd like firstly to challenge the common conflation 
of brutalism and social housing. They are not the same thing. Most post-war social housing wasn't brutalist, and most brutalism wasn't social housing. And I'd like, too, to challenge the idea that brutalism is a style with a consistent political meaning behind it. It is no more consistently politically uh, specific than any other style. As the great building in which we now sit reveals, the Barbican was built by the Corporation of the City of London in order to defend itself from takeover from the London County Council uh, because the London County Council was transparent and left-wing neither of which suit the interests of the uh, corporations of the City of London Square Mile. Uh, and brutalism in a totally recognisably same visual form occurs in political regimes as different as Scandinavia, uh, the USSR, the USA and Franco's Spain. Uh, and draw a line through those to show the common element other than the brutalist architecture, I challenge you. So what I would argue brutalism is, to get us off to a start, before we discuss whether it's back, is a style that celebrates cheap energy. It was the cheapest energy there had ever been. It was getting cheaper faster than it had ever got cheaper. And uh, concrete, glass and steel were made possible by the, uh, to use on a massive scale by cheap energy, as were lifts and heating, facilities previously unknown even to the middle classes in many cases. Uh, and this enabled architecture for all purposes and for all clients to burst into a huge period of new creativity. So, is it back? Yes, to a large extent, but not enough. People sound concessive. There's some quite good brutalist architecture, you know. Whereas, in fact, they should be recognising it as the best architecture there has ever been. It is as confident, as high in skill from the architects, the engineers and the builders uh, as competitive between the designers uh, as any other architectural period. There was more going on and more competition and more expertise and more astounding results as, on the back of it. However, the fact that it's coming back brings with it its dangers. So the danger of trendiness is that uh, where benign neglect used to be uh, a major fate for really good brutalist buildings, they're now suffering uh, intentional, overexcited intervention. And uh, if you look at a case like uh, Balfour and Tower that you were mentioning, uh, it was remarkably unaltered for a long time, apart from bits and bobs of decay and some, some poor quality changes uh, made under, under budgetary pressure. But a lot of it remained very much as designed by the great Erno Goldfinger. Uh, it was then, as it became clear that this was not only listed, but also going to have a value from its trendiness, uh, sold off by the um, Housing Association to uh, a property developers, uh, London Newcastle as I understand it, uh, who have, uh, in some combination, I do not know who has been the active parties in this, but the residents have all left uh, in a spirit, in at least some cases, of extreme ill will. Uh, the noise of that objection has been partially muffled uh, by precisely the enjoyable and engaging uh, arts activities um, that we've been hearing about from Bow Arts. Uh, and now it's just had planning permission for a refurbishment that is very insensitive and that's going to gut all the flats um, in terms of moving internal walls uh, and uh, replace the windows with windows that, in the view of uh, expert commentators are not going to be a satisfactory uh, replacement of the originals, although they are re replacing bad intermediate ones in the meanwhile. Uh, and it just feels unnecessary. Uh, this style has come back in and is therefore becoming a target for property developers and for um, uh, profit-making activity. So uh, brutalism is back. It's not yet back enough and parts of its rev revived popularity are in themselves bringing dangers to the architecture itself and to its original purposes. Brilliant. Thank you. In a 2003 survey by Grey London, the Barbican won the dubious award of London's ugliest building. The Barbican has certainly not always been loved. 
Chamberlain Powell and Bond's vast project of a high-density housing estate of over 2,000 units surrounding Europe's largest multi-arts and conference centre took 30 years from conception to completion, and when the Barbican Arts Centre opened in 1982, the entire the estate's 1950s planning was already very much out of fashion. Today, the arts centre and the estate is widely held to be a brutalist masterpiece. As part of a greater trend of appreciation of brutalist buildings in the past five to ten years, popularity for the Barbican's architecture has been aided by the centre's self-promotion, as well as the architecture tours, talks and exhibitions. Just take a look at the display in the ground floor shop for a love affair of all things brutalist. Now, the estate's residents have also been instrumental in increasing appeal and value for the Barbican too. Their organisation is getting the estate listed and they're now pushing for further protection by getting the estate designated a conservation area. So we have reached some critical distance from the original planning scheme, which makes it easier to look back and appreciate what Chamberlain, Powell and Bond intended for the Barbican estate. In the provocation for this panel, the question is asked, is there something paradoxical about revering as heritage a style that was supposedly about tearing up the past and boldly putting function before ornament? Well, this depends on what kind of brutalism we are talking about. The Barbican project, despite its striking high-density buildings and robust concrete, is emphatically not an exercise in tearing up the past and putting function before ornament. Throughout the Barbican project, we find various motifs which make visual references to the history of this site. Some of these are simply ornamental, although in a weighty sculptural style, and these include the use of the semicircle, which takes its visual cue from the bastion of the London Wall that you can see by the lakeside, uh, and the crenellation of the Church of St Giles Cripplegate, and these older buildings form the basis of a historic precinct in the centre of this estate from which various decorative references are drawn. In traversing the high walks of the Barbican, you can look down on these old survivors of the site. The lake and the use of the gravestones and the decorative lamps around uh, the church and the wall elevate this sense of history in the centre of the estate. Additionally there, additionally, there is imagery recalling medieval fortresses such as the arrow slit windows found on the high walks. And all of this is set in a European-inspired planning system of walkways, precincts, squares and fountains with repeated references to both Rome and Venice. In fact, this historic scheme could have been far more explicit as revealed in earlier plans for the estate. In the early plans, Chamberlain, Powell and Bond proposed re-erecting Temple Bar, the ornamental Baroque gateway designed by Sir Christopher Wren, as a grand triumphal entrance into the Barbican estate, heralding the estate's position as the entrance to the City of London. Likewise, their first thoughts on what would eventually become the Arts Centre, Geoffrey Powell mused, Incidentally, it has occurred to us that if the inclusion of a small exhibition hall should be desirable, the state coach could be a permanent exhibition. So the Barbican then, far from tearing up the past, has been involved in a heritage game from the very beginning. This relationship between the modern and historic city buildings was part of a much wider plan that the City of London briefly envisaged, in which the vast pedway scheme for connecting the Barbican all the way to the South Bank Centre via a network of elevated walkways would create a new pedestrian level of shops and businesses and entrance to the large raised buildings. Street level, therefore, would be for traffic and the older historic buildings to which you could periodically descend. So perhaps we should argue, as some do, that the Barbican is not strictly brutalist after all and that the reasons for its success and longevity are because it is an exception and not the rule to brutalism. During those 30 years of planning and construction and the addition of the Arts Centre, the original budget of 16 million rocketed to over 150 million pounds. The homes here, which were built as council property, were never social housing. They were always designed to be let at full market rate, and these days most are privately owned. So we can talk about whether a more middle-class brutalism with a sense of local and national history mixed with this European-inspired planning is strictly brutalist and whether this is more or less likely to be revived than the brutalist architecture of what Owen Hathaway has called modernism's angry underside and Raina Bannum described as a rough poetry dragged out of the confused and powerful forces at work in mass-producing society. We can talk about whether the Barbican is unusual or whether in celebrating brutalism as a unique modern movement, we miss that historical turn taken in many brutalist buildings and not just the Barbican. One final note to make about the housing here, as has been noted, there is increasing appreciation for both the ethic and aesthetic of brutalism, but there seems to be no corresponding enthusiasm for new mass housing schemes along similar lines. In fact, encouraging for housing development in its current state would seem to have been anathema to Chamberlain, Powell and Bonn and many other arch brutalist architects and planners. In their planning documents for the Barbican, uh, they stated, we strongly dislike the garden city tradition with low density monotony, waste of good countryside, roads, roads curbs, borders, paths and the rest. We like a strong contrast between true town and true country. 
Now, we can contrast this to the government paper published in March this year, encouraging local councils to build locally-led garden villages, towns and cities. What constitutes a new garden city was not exactly clear, except that it must abide by garden city standards, but evidently there is an attempt to reverse the trend of the population moving out of the countryside and small towns and into the city, the opposite of the, the intentions that had been there for the Barbican estate. Super. Thank you, Lucy. I'm going to disagree with Barnabas, um, which I guess is the point of these sessions. Um, so I'm going to start by saying that neo-brutalism uh, was a product of its particular time. And in part, it was a reaction against the previous architects, a generation who had sold out their social and socialist principles to a technocratic modernism, particularly as they moved across the Atlantic to America. It was also expedient. So the time of austerity in the UK, after the Second World War, um, materials, uh, the constituents of concrete were quite plentiful and relatively affordable, whereas steel was still scarce and rationed. So in the post-war political consensus, there was a form of covenant that the state would provide a safety net for the population through welfare in the NHS, that it would provide affordable homes for life, although I do agree that uh, little social housing was actually brutalist, um, and that there was a, a promise of a future meritocracy and the social mobility for your children that that would imply. So brutalist buildings do have a political meaning, do have a, a political purpose, that they signified this break with the past um, and uh, this separation or, or this kind of breakdown of social classes. But there's a paradox, because this is supposedly egalitarian architecture, was born out of a political and technical elite who were entrenched in the paternalistic culture. Politicians and planners unquestioningly knew or assumed that they knew what was best and that they were entitled to make those decisions for the common man. So the masses would be improved by their top-down state-led philanthropy, whether they like it or not. Now, architecture, like all human endeavours, can be read as a collection of signs. But those signs, as Lucy's been describing, um, are not a lingua franca. They mean different things to different people at different times. And architects, self-included, uh, talk in a, in a language of metaphors. So brutalist buildings are described as honest. They were going to be egalitarian. They would be everyday and ordinary, but where the ordinary is elevated to a form of art. In learning from Las Vegas, uh, Bob Venturi and Denise Scott Brown contrasted their postmodern architecture, which comprised of ugly and ordinary signifiers, against the alienating abstraction of modernism, which for them was represented by Paul Rudolph's brutalism. And we're still struggling with some of these competing semiotics. So on the one hand, this architectural form, mass social housing, the NHS, places like this for high culture, is a bit of an embarrassing reminder of that broken social covenant as the political middle ground moved to the right since 1979. In Karl Marx's fa uh, famous phrase, history repeats itself, first as tragedy and second as farce. So the language which was used by the modernist planners to justify raising Victorian monstrosities and slum tenements, which are actually neither, is now the same language which is used to demonize brutalist buildings and increasingly to denigrate postmodern buildings as well. On the other hand, we tend to think of heritage as being about preservation. So, as has been mentioned, brutalist buildings are being reevaluated, at least aesthetically. But what do they mean? Why do we want to preserve them? And that, I think, is the open question. For those of you that don't know this building, this is St. Peter's Cardross Seminary um, by Gillespie and Coya outside Glasgow. About 15 years ago, I, with uh, the photographer of um, this image, uh, Dan Dubovitz, and a student from Dundee University, John Deffenbaugh, uh, we set up a campaign to save this building. Um, and um, we firmly believed that the building was of sufficient merit, it was A-listed, um, that it was worthy of um, consideration for some kind of uh, attempt at uh, restoration. This is the condition it was in when we began the campaign uh, 15 years ago. We, um, this is uh, looking in the other direction, 
We generated a reasonable amount of publicity for this campaign 15 years ago. Um, I remember going on the culture show um, and um, being interviewed by somebody on the culture show about it. And this moment kind of particularly sticks in my mind has made me think quite a bit about this discussion around brutalism. Um, because I found myself in a position whereby, I'm just showing you some images of what it was like originally and why we thought it was worth saving. I found myself in a position whereby um, I could explain very clearly what was good about this building as a piece of architecture. And I did that to the BBC and that went down very well. Um, but they then asked me um, to speak more personally about why I thought it was so important, so worth saving. And I've got in my mind, it's one of those things where um, you say something in the media and then you lay in bed awake at night thinking about it, thinking, oh, no, they, that wasn't the right words. But I said this thing, I said, oh, it, it sings of the optimism of the post-war period. And quite a few people repeated back to me and said, oh, that's really nice, Penny. Sings of the optimism of the post-war period. Uh, but I felt really uncomfortable with it, and I couldn't quite work out why I felt so uncomfortable with it. I mean, you look at the images, and clearly it does sing with the optimism of the post-war period. There's, there's, there's something there. But the reason we'd begun the campaign was not because we were nostalgic for the welfare state or, or nostalgic for the 1950s. It's because we thought the building was um, exquisite and excellent of its, of, of its type uh, and was an important part of um, Scotland's cultural uh, heritage. So the first point that I'd like to make is that um, somebody this morning in one of the sessions talked about radical nostalgia. I think the re-enthusiasm for brutalism is part of a radical nostalgia, and I myself am prepared to admit I'm a little bit part of that radical nostalgia, in that we look to um, that period, and there's a very beautiful film being made by Murray Greger about the building when it opened, where you can see these hippie-like uh, priests, trainee priests walking around with their long hair and their jeans. They look like something out of Gregory's Girl, although it's a bit earlier than Gregory's Girl. Uh, but they're clearly sort of very much part of that generation of people who in the post-war period had a sense of possibility and things opening up. Uh, it's very easy for us to look at, at, at this period and, and this work and, and, um, and sort of be nostalgic for something about it. Although I agree with Barnabas that it's wrong for us to say brutalist architecture is associated with any particular political idea. I think uh, the large volume of work that was produced in the 1960s um, had a certain character to it, inevitable character to it, uh, which was tied to the fact that people um, were relatively optimistic about the possibilities of that period. So that's my first point. This is a, an image of that building by Toby Patterson, and it's just to emphasize the fact that around the same time, around sort of 2004, um, you saw the emergence of a number of artists who were also working on this building and part of that process of developing their work in relation to what they saw as brutalist, iconic buildings. And at the same time, the pictures at the beginning give you a sense that there was also the emergence of what's been called dereliction porn, you know, the creation of images of buildings that are under the process of, of being eroded and uh, have been neglected and abandoned. And certainly in the campaign, we emphasized the fact that we felt that the Catholic Church and the Scottish government were being philistine in their failure to take account of this, the importance of this building. Right, last year, or no, yes, for the last few years, there's been a campaign to save this building. Not, not anything to do with, with me and my friends, it's by uh, an organization called MVA. And um, in the spring, they did this fantastic um, light and, and sound show. And I went along, and at some levels, I really enjoyed it, and I'm very pleased about the work that they've done, uh, funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund and others, in order to bring the building uh, to a position where it's safe to, to walk around it. But I have to say, um, that singing of the optimism of the post-war period is not the way this building has been appropriated in its new reincarnation. In fact, this sound and light show was incredibly gothic. It was very dark. The emphasis in the lighting was on the graffiti, and the emphasis in a lot of the coverage of it is on the fact that we no longer have this optimistic icon. We have something else. And the light show um, also intimated about the shady character of the Catholic Church. There was sort of visual uh, things that made you think about the shady character of the, the Catholic Church. 
So I've tried to think about what happened just in a, a 10 year period. I mean, admittedly, we were losing the argument when we had it in just around 2000 uh, to change the fortunes of this building and what's changed about the attitude. And in a way, I, I just want to sort of raise one idea, which is um, what this is uh, celebrated for now is its rawness. So this brutalist building, that wasn't officially brutalist, but it's known as brutalist building, was, is now celebrated um, because of its rawness um, and, and its energy. And in fact, Barnabas uses the expression raw in, his, um, in the title of his book. And I think that's a very interesting thing for us to reflect on. Um, because I would argue, and Sylvia Lavin, uh, the architectural writer from the US, has written um, that we should think about the raw and the cooked. We should, we should think about contemporary society and its preoccupation with rawness. The thing that I loved about St. Peter's Cardross was that it was incredibly refined. It wasn't raw, it was incredibly sophisticated. It was the high point of the sophistication of the modern movement. Uh, and that's what's worth celebrating about the work that was developed in that period. Uh, and I'm not sure that rawness is really uh, what we should take from the work in that period. Um, just as Michael introduced, we, we're a practice in London and we work across a, a range of sectors. And I thought it was just worth putting some background to that. We do a lot of refurbishment work in London. And so we've actually been working on a lot of uh, Colonel Seifert's uh, buildings. And we're also working on the refurbishment and extension of Camden Town Hall Annex. And it's through those works that I found it really interesting that I can't profess to have a love of brutalism, but I have a real understanding and appreciation of the characteristics of what they were trying to do, the honesty and integrity of its construction and materials is actually quite exquisite when you get into the, the layers of how those buildings have been put together. What I would say, though, is I think, it's, uh, I, I think I see it as a guilty pleasure. I thought I would start by just um, going to my professional body, the Royal Institute of British Architects. We say, you should consider brutalism as architecture in the raw, with an emphasis on materials, textures, and construction producing highly expressive forms. Scale was important, and the style was characterized by massive concrete shapes colliding abruptly while service ducts and ventilation towers are overtly displayed. Now, what surprised me about that definition was that there's much more to this, and I think we've touched on some of this, is that brutalism was also seen as a reaction by a younger generation to the, the lightness and optimism of the, the 30s and 40s. It also expressed an atmosphere of architects that one does look at the moral seriousness of, of that, um, that style. And I think that, combined with the, um, the socially progressive intentions of the time, meant that brutalism was promoted as a, a forward-thinking uh, solution for the modern urban housing that, that we uh, heard about. Now, that was then used a lot in education buildings, not so much in the corporate world, but what then became uh, apparent was in the late 20th century, it became the word brutal was the thing that stood out from it. So why do I think it's maybe becoming or enjoying a renaissance? Part of the reason could be that um, if you look at the Instagram followers of brutal architecture, they have some 95,000 followers. When you compare that with the Victorian society, they have 200 followers on Instagram. If you compare their Twitter accounts, Brussels Architecture has 32,000 followers, Victorian society has none. <laughs> so is there something in about the Instagramification of brutalism that we all enjoy? Do we actually like that beautiful, wonderful image? But, or is there more to it? There, is, there has been a renaissance, and especially in the late 90s, for warehouse and loft conversions to express raw concrete and the brickwork. Or is it more than that? Is it a protest against the greed of the current housing that's seen as being you know, for the elite and overseas investment? Or is it a signal of change and discontent? What I would like to, to argue is that I think it is about a signal of change and discontent. We know in June of this year there was a, a, a milestone moment in our evolution as a, as a country. And I think when brutalism was uh, at its... Uh, pinnacle, it was about uh, you know, answering a significant question. So can bre Brexitism be the new brutalism? You know, can we actually look at the characteristics of that? 
Can we provoke a reaction in a younger generation? Can we instill a more moral, more moral seriousness in what we do? And also provide so socially progressive intentions. Now, is no Brexit a moment for us to look to the future? Can we look at brutalism as a way of formulating a new way of thinking? So I agree that we should reference the past, but it's to create a new future. Thank you. Let's just um, see, um, see what you thought of any of the points that were made. I was trying to convince my sisters to come to this very talk, and she said no, because brutalist buildings are really ugly. And I was like, no, you're wrong. But then there's, for many people, if we're talking about the new brutalism and I come back, there's a certain aesthetic element that is not appealing to, for want of a better word, the layman. That there is something about brutalism that is, for many people, inherently aesthetically displeasing to them. And I was wondering if the panel have any answers or ideas of, of, of or responses to that at all. Just a very quick question. Uh, Barnabas, you, were, you, you said about the origins, I suppose, of, of brutalism reflecting cheap energy. Concrete was plentiful uh, and, and all that. Uh, so it, it does beg the question as to why it is now popular. You know, in an era when energy is the thing that everyone is paranoid about, uh, and you shouldn't use any of it, if possible. Uh, that we're now kind of celebrating a, a profligate architecture. Uh, and, and, in, and, and John's final remarks I thought were very interesting about the, the, the new Brexitism. But again, is that a romance? Is that a, you know, the idea of brutalism or modernism per se was one which was looking to a new style rather than looking to an old style as a reference point? So it, it does the comparison bear, bear witness? I was really interested in what you said about Instagram and that kind of maybe being why it's become more, more popular. I have noticed on, on Twitter um, a kind of craze for looking at brutalist architecture. And there seems to almost be a sort of competitiveness about who can post the most brutal image. <laughs> and and, I, and I, I, I've been fascinated by it and I've also been doing it kind of, oh, look, there's something really brutal. Let's put, that, put it up there. And... Um, I've been quite interested in that, and I'm not sure whether it's actually a joy or appreciation necessarily, possibly it is, but on one hand, I, th I think it might be a kind of competitiveness. Who can, who can spot the most obscene and appalling block of concrete? I, I mean, I have actually, through doing that, come to really appreciate it, which is really interesting. <laughs> um, but I, I feel like that might be where it starts for some people, and then the appreciation develops. I don't know. Um, is the current um, brutalism revival perhaps a bit half-hearted in comparison to the original? Um, in the same time period Penny was describing, I'd been a tenant in Park Hill Flats in Sheffield. We all got paid to move out. Not many people moved back in. The estate was urban splashed, when you use a company name as a verb. And it didn't <laughs> look much like the old Park Hill Flats when you came back because they'd gone from raw concrete to uh, the sort of plexiglass colour panels in all the spots. And um, uh, read lately, they do keep one old style flat aside as a set for filming This Is England in. Um, but, bro but basically, the, the Park Hill Flats brutalism revival doesn't seem much like the old one, not least because the original tenants can't get back in. So is it, are we talking about two different things here? Good. Okay, so there are some other people that want to come in. If you just hold uh, for one second, I'll get the panel uh, to respond. Well, a couple of points here. I think the Instagram thing is, I, I use it lightheartedly, but it's quite, it is really genuinely quite interesting because to me, it's like any other addiction. I think once you start it, you just carry on and how do you get, <laughs> how do you get off of it? I think with Instagram, I think the reason I use that is that Instagram is a two-dimensional image, and it is about, a, to my mind, is a graphic and a photograph. It's, it is, no, not slightly, it is detached from the reality of the experience of that building. And I think this is where I find a genuine interest that we were talking earlier beforehand, that there is sufficient time has passed since when these buildings were actually uh, built to uh, have a generational gap that you can appreciate something having not experienced it, because I think there's a genuine difference between experiencing brutalism and when it was uh, put, you know, imposed on us, I suppose, is, is the, probably the right phrase, to looking back at this uh, maybe sort of beautiful, romantic you know, sense that actually it must have been quite fantastic of its time. 
Well, that, that's certainly not some of the research. If you look at some of the research of people that, that lived in those, it probably not, doesn't actually compare. I think just uh, on Austin's point about referencing uh, the past, the reason that I think it does reference the past is that at times, you know, throughout the evolution of you know, where, where we are, we've always had you no know, challenges to deal with sort of major concerns, and we've had to you know, make sort of major infrastructural and futuristic changes. You know, back in the Victorian period, over a period of 50 years, we went from 16 million to just over 30 million in population. That's an 80% increase in population. Now, at the moment, in the same sort of period looking forward from where we are now, we're only talking about a 16% increase in population. So our, our problems are what people call first world problem. It's not really a problem. But the, the, the question is, how do we react to it? And I, and I think that's why I want to look back at the brutalism and how it's reacted to say, come on, let's get, let's get going and do something new. Let's go for it. Annie, anything? Well, in, in terms of why people love it, I mean, I, when I first went onto the um, Brutalism Appreciation page on Facebook, I started posting every time saying, no, that's not actually brutalism. <laughs> no, that's not actually brutalism, just because it's concrete or just because it's from the 1960s. And then I realised that I'd lost that battle. And, uh, no, that, was, that was silly. But the more you look at the material on those sites, and um, I went on a bus, um, with people looking at St. Peter's when they did the, the light show, and I expected it to be all crusty old architects, but actually it was young 30-somethings from Glasgow who, they were on that bus because they saw um, St. Peter's as culturally authentic. It's kind of, it's energy and it's rawness and it's decay. All of those things together were a package that they, they saw as representing cultural authenticity associated with social welfareism, which they think is absent in contemporary cultural production and particularly in contemporary buildings. So while contemporary buildings are thin and temporary and meaningless and don't speak to us of anything, there's this idea that these buildings still can say something. And I, and I think that's why it's loved. And it's kind of uh, nice to say that you're developing an aesthetic sensibility uh, which has a higher understanding of beauty other than the conventional one that you would get on bake, 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 um, you know, on mainstream television or whatever, Bake Off or whatever our idea of what a pretty cake is, you know. So, so I think that's about authenticity and cultural authenticity. Why people don't like it, um, I think, is really much bigger question and, and, and very interesting. And I think, um, although Barnabas is right that <coughs> brutalism isn't just about social housing, I don't think that we can separate the idea of brutalism from the estates. And we all know that the estates um, were the state taking a very active and overbearing role in the production of housing, our private domain, uh, for a period of 20 years from the 19, uh, mid-1950s onwards. And I think that we have to face up to the fact that that project was, was a a failure, and part of the reason it was a failure was because the state was very overbearing, and, and, and we created estates which people felt that they had no way out of, and any sense of um, being able to sort of um, progress in society um, was sort of somehow the, the failure of society to move forward by the 70s and 80s was captured in in these estates, that the, the mass housing estates, and I and I, I think that when cultural critics get excited about brutalism, they have to also recognise that there's really good reasons why the majority of the population see brutalist housing estates as highly problematic because they associate it with being trapped. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up from your final point because I think it is probably the most important and then I'll go into the much more frivolous subject of style. Um, yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think the, the, the fundamental problem um, is, is a warn of choice or lack of choice. And I think that, that goes in both directions, whether we're talking about Belfront Tower and persuading people to leave on the basis that they're going to get new kitchens and, they, and when they move in, it's all going to be lovely and energy efficient, and then once they're out, then all of a sudden it gets the whole, um, well, it's popular hardcore, but the, the urban splash uh, treatment. Um, so that, that's, taking, that's taking away people's choices. The people who wanted to live there uh, who were the social tenants, that, by that privatisation, that, that their choices have been taken away. In much the same way that people were put into those buildings 
who wouldn't necessarily have chosen them in the first place. And I think socially that's, that's where the problems lie. Then there's all kinds of technical issues about you know, lack of maintenance and that kind of idea of, of benign neglect, which wasn't, wasn't ever really so, you know, so benign. In terms of, of this question, is brutalism back? Well, I don't think it is. I think we've got kind of two, two things going on. I think the uh, architecture has a very slow cycle of fashion. So I'm, I'm of a generation uh, where, well, when I was at the Mac, uh, these guys, Gillespie, Kidd and Coyer, were, were our esteemed lecturers. Um, I was told, never say anything bad about the dead, so I won't mention <laughs> anything more about them, but let's just put it this way, we didn't see eye to eye on things. Students I now teach, love it. You know, it's all this stuff about kind of raw materials and they get all excited about rough shutter concrete and that kind of thing. You know, it, it's this sort of 20 year fashion cycle, it's back. Um, doesn't particularly please me, which is kind of interesting to be on a, on a kind of panel like this, but there you go. Um, I just think that it's maybe a bit limited uh, what you get with um, you know, things like the Switch House at uh, Tate Modern. Um, is it back in sense of, of heritage? Well, yes it is, to some extent. Uh, and I think that as a country, we're, we're fudging it in the way that we usually do. Um, so we're losing some of the good examples, we're saving some of the mediocre examples. Um, that's just the nature of, of heritage. Um, I, th I think we, we need... To, I've changed my mind on this, but, and again, this is going back to my kind of time at, at university. My, my big hero is Cedric Price. And Cedric was always good for a kind of rent a quote. So he was asked after the, the fire of York Minster what they should do with it, and he said, well, demolish it. Um, you know, it's, it's served its purpose. It's been there a few hundred years. Let's use the land for something else. Um, I think as, as, a, as a, a kind of Western society, we, sort of, we, we maintain our history, our heritage through these objects. So I think it's important that we do say some of these things. But I think, as I say, the, the question is, why do we want to save them? Well, if we're saving them because some developer makes a load of money out of it and it takes away choices from the people who were living there, I think that says something fairly negative about us as a society. Just to respond very briefly to the point that came up earlier about um, sort of why people love the look of brutalism, um, one of the most popular images at the moment that you can find at the Barbican, um, one of the prints that they sell, is of the hand-pick hammering of the concrete. So you've got somebody in a face mask pounding away at these surfaces, and people just go nuts for that picture. They really love the, um, the, the, the physicality and the, um, the reassuring solidity of the material stuff that you can see it being built. It does seem to be um, this uh, business of what's uh, good to Instagram, the more kind of solid uh, the picture seems to be um, what people love. Um, but I think um, it's a question about if Bruce isn't back and what we're and so what we are appreciating about it. Um, it does seem unfortunate that some uh, buildings, uh, the buildings and the material are being appreciated, whereas perhaps some of the planning, uh, the landscaping and the topographical um, ideas are being lost. So um, just to go back to uh, what John mentioned about this idea of having some critical distance where perhaps you're not, the building is not imposed on you, means you can uh, appreciate it in a different way. Um, with the example of the Barbican, the original scheme was that um, you would enter via the high walks if you're a pedestrian and wander around the estate and explore before making your way to the art centre. Or if you were driving, you would drive in uh, to the underground car parks and pop up from underground, emerging at the lakeside as a real uh, kind of revelatory moment. Um, in fact, uh, largely what happened was a lot of people would arrive on foot on the outside of the estate, looking at the very large concrete walls, trying to work out how you would get in and what happens when you're inside. The experience of being on the outside of some kind of fortress. Um, you mentioned the idea of uh, feeling trapped in architecture, I think the idea with the barbican was largely to make the residents feel safe as opposed to trapped, but I think it did have that problem as an outsider. Well, they weren't trapped because they, they had money. Exactly, <laughs> they weren't trapped, they were there because they wanted to be. But um, with the uh, new front entrance that was built to the Arts Centre in 2003, we have essentially killed the high walk system in that you don't need to enter via the high walks to reach the Arts Centre, you can come around uh, Silk Street and only explore the rest of the estate and the walkways if you want to. Um, 
because that is the case and people do not have the walkway system imposed on, on them anymore, there is that space to explore it at leisure um, and take some interest in it. Um, but I do think it's unfortunate to look at something like the Barbican without appreciating that wider planning system. The idea, if it had the huge pedway system all over the city of London, that you would be knitted into the rest of the city and it would be a whole separate experience for pedestrians with businesses and shops and all sorts up there, um, with traffic being entirely separate, a completely different safe scheme. That has largely gone because uh, the pedway system never really got going. There are a few walkways built here and there in the city. Um, it never really joined up, and the Barbican is slightly isolated now and having that not really connecting to anything else. So it's a, a curio that we can look at now. Um, and just to finish up on that, um, it does seem to be the thing that is being lost where some of these buildings, not necessarily just brutalist buildings, but where some of these kind of great 20th century buildings are being saved, or perhaps new buildings, like you mentioned, take modern extension, perhaps being built in that spirit. What we lose is the, the landscape and the gardening, for instance, the new design museum, uh, the reopened, um, the former Commonwealth Institute in South Kensington. The new building has been refurbished. Uh, it's going to be, I'm sure, a great museum, but what is lost is the 20th century landscaping. It's now the new housing by OMA on that site. The new Tate Modern Extension. Um, there is a lot of public space and circulation within that building. There's not a lot in terms of um, garden and landscaping and genuine street-level public space connecting that around the buildings to the rest of the city. I think that's something that is being lost in those kind of buildings. This idea of being trapped is a very interesting one and not, I think, very rigorously proven. Uh, people give rival anecdotes about what it is like to live on social housing estates at different periods and in different places and at different moments in their history uh, and in the lives of the people living there. I don't know whether people in this room could tell you with confidence whether where you live now is successful or failed. It's not a question you ever ask about your own housing. Uh, it's something that's massively complex. I've lived in horribly inconvenient, leaky flats that I've absolutely loved, and extremely uh, warm, safe, straightforward ones that I've found much less charming and where I've been less happy because of other factors in my life. Uh, there isn't a straightforward correlation for me. Why should we assume that there is for entire groups of population? What you do get, however, is very pronounced socioeconomic problems clustering in some estates, which do produce, by the later 1970s and 80s, um, statistical clusterings of uh, life misfortunes and uh, unpleasant things uh, that probably do make for estates as nasty or nearly as nasty as some of the stories about them. But uh, the extent to which that's anything to do with the architecture is very, very unclear. Uh, as the Barbican shows by being at least as tough as anything else in the country and uh, extremely safe uh, and extremely um, popular and loved. Uh, and for every anecdote you can find of an individual saying that they hate uh, their council estate, you can find another one that says the opposite. So in terms of being trapped, uh, in one of the um, Dennis Lasden's uh, cluster blocks in the East End, I met a woman whose father was at the first generation in there with her as a small child. And he had, as a skilled craftsman, bought himself a condemned house in order to be rehoused into this block because he was so excited to get in there, which doesn't sound like being trapped at that stage in the late 1950s. So I think the story is very, very complicated and very non-linear. Um, as for the uh, question that Austin asked about uh, why really, really energetically problematic architecture is so popular at a period where we are... Uh, all rightly obsessed with trying to reduce energy uh, consumption in architecture. Uh, I think there's, for architects, a huge element of wish, wish fulfillment. Uh, you can ha fantasize about being a 60s architect who didn't need to worry about cold bridges, didn't need to worry about triple glazing, and could have exactly the disposition of structure and outside wall that you wanted without any panics about that. And for non-architects, there's something 
so aesthetically different about something like the Barbican Estate with its incredibly tactile, uh, strong looking exteriors and the kinds of blocks that you see going up as the standard new blocks of flats where actually when you watch them going up they contain nearly as much concrete. There's a huge in situ concrete frame first and then this thick cladding of uh, fuzz and outside that a bit of rainproofing and the rainproofing is what you actually see and it never has the believability and solidity that I think people probably therefore react to quite favourably when they see it in older buildings. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to say at this stage is that uh, having taken a pop at uh, your organisation in my, in my uh, presentation, I, uh, I think you should have a right of reply despite being chair. <laughs> it's your call, obviously. Okay, so I've got uh, some other people that want to speak. I'd like to challenge the last speaker about what he said, because you say brutalism is back. Have you actually been to the other side of the Iron Curtain? and seen the attitudes of the people who've now got a bit of money and can move away from those sort of housing prospects in Poland and the Czech Republic that they were forced to grow up in. Because I can tell you now that they, they'll run a country mile rather than go back to that. Anybody with a bit of money in Poland and the Czech Republic, they build a bit of the, buy a bit of land and they build a proper house. They hated it. <laughs> So uh, when you say it's back, is it really back? Uh, or, it, or might it just be back with sort of Hoxton romanticism about how wonderful it all was very when Labour were in power? Yeah. Maybe. Very um, quick I'll reply. give you an instant. Thank you. Uh, it's very locally specific. So uh, you can't tell a single world story, and I'm not trying to. Uh, they were still building it much later. They had much more of it. Uh, and it's a very clear status thing to be moving out of it. And, and it's already and falling down. Of course, and, well. and you've, is, wound, you've wound everyone up now, can it, 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 <laughs> yeah, it is back. I get uh, Polish and Latvian and some Soviet students that want to come and study their tradition and are really interested in writing the history of their modernist tradition. And just as with Britain, there's some really awful system buildings and there's some really good ones where architects really struggled against the system to produce something of quality, so it's not all one-dimensional, even in, in the Eastern Bloc. Okay, good. Um, I just wanted to ask Penny, you mentioned um, kind of several artists as well as yourself that had at the same time um, developed an interest in the same building, and that level of sort of simultaneous interest seems unlikely. And I wondered specifically to you, but also to everybody else, if brutalism is back from all these different for all these different reasons, how have they come back? Is it just serendipity that they've all occurred at the same time, or is it something? Is there something that's caused all of them to appear at the same moment? Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, truth in what Penny says about the rawness thing and how that accounts for some of the popularity uh, today. The 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 most remarkable thing about brutalism that struck me over the past while is how uh, much Lino Bobardi is regarded positively these days. I mean, out of nowhere, really, it seems that uh, she's just taken on a life. So you've got the Observer Architecture uh, correspondent who's more or less dedicated a book to her. Uh, you have an exhibition by the British Council, which I think has gone round about 10 <laughs> different countries now, which suggests that actually it's not just the UK uh, that's that's uh, w where it's popular. So. I th and, and, and I think the, the, the designers of that exhibition assemble are probably proof in a way that actually there's a, there's a few different things going on here because their brutalist playground uh, intervention I think was a kind of nostalgia for some of the freedom actually of that period of brutalism and the, and the, and the fact that kids could roam a bit more widely. So I think there are a few uh, different things going on here but my question really is um, as to the origins of brutalism rather than its return and what accounts for that because it does seem to me that... Um, you know, and to continue with Lena Bobardi, if you look at the emergence of her, it seemed to me that she was very definitely a reaction to the kind of nightmare modernism, the, the kind of more futuristic modernism of the, the kind of post-war period in Brazil. And I just wonder if there's something in what Sebastian's saying, actually, about uh, it being a reaction to some of the dynamism of modernism. And actually, even in its origins, uh, there were some things that actually suggested a bit of a slowdown in ambition, a bit of kind of uh, dead of, of, of that kind of initial dynamism of the post-war period. 
I also wanted to um, comment on Penny's talk about St. Peter's. I also went to that event, which was done by NVA at St. Peter's Seminary earlier this year. Um, absolutely a stunning building. Um, but just in regard to the kind of radical nostalgia, I think the building was only open about 11 years. And you may remember there was a big pool of water, inky black water with a drip kind of going into it as part of the sort of light and the art show. And that was in reference to the fact that it leaked right from the outset, the building. And um, one of the difficulties about the building was that it was exceptionally cold in the Scottish winters. Um, just in relation to the dereliction porn, um, I had a chance to talk to Angus Farquhar, who is leading with MVA. And um, it's interesting that they've got 4.2 million from a heritage lottery fund, and they're planning to use the building as an art center. Um, I think it will be quite challenging. But the plans for the building are to actually keep and incorporate some of the dereliction into how they develop um, the building. And I thought that was just an interesting comment on the dereliction itself being an attraction. I don't think I was saying that um, the brutalism was a, a kind of slowdown. I think, if anything, it was it was reacting against um, those, those earlier modernists essentially kind of doing their greatest hits. Um, if you, if you look at it in, in relation to, to the Congress International, um, it, the group around uh, the Smithsons were effectively staging a coup against Le Corbusier and, and, and the kind of older generation. Um, so I don't, I don't think that it's... I think part of its, its appeal is that, that it, it, it is that kind of sort of yesterday's future. It is the, the concrete-tinted spectacles. Um, and the reason why I say I don't think that, it, that it's coming back is because I think we're in, a, we're in a different time. But there are some similarities. There are things around austerity. Um, there are things around um, local and national identity. Because brutalism was uh, a version of modernism which was supposed to be inflected by uh, local characteristics, which is why people like um, the Bobardi uh, in Brazil are, are kind of relevant. I think in that particular case is also a, look, we've discovered a female architect, let's celebrate her. Um, Can I just ask you yeah. so, uh, directly on this, Sebastian? So, so in, I, I, I sort of get that the, the sort of, uh, you, you know, the way that you're characterizing that moment and the, you know, the Smithsons and the Smithsons uh, reacting, uh, you know, against some of, some of the changes at the time, but isn't the, isn't it fair to say, and I think, I think the Guardian article, the review of your book, sort of uh, you know, raised this point, but that, the, you know, that in a way, part of what the Smithsons were reacting against um, and, you know, and, and working on that idea of brutalism as something that is sort of brutish or sharp or unforgiving, that they were reacting against a certain softening of some of the principles of modernism, yeah, which in a way suggests that, you know, when you think how cuddly many of you architects are today and how, how keen you are to engage with, you know, with people looking out for, you know, the odd place for an artist to, to practice for a little bit, you know, isn't that, isn't there something in that principle of the, of the architects being really principled and being firm and being able to stand for what they believe in? That was part of that uh, that 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 moment, and uh, and what do we think about that uh, in relation to today? Well, as, as I say, I think it, the, it was a moment in time, and it was in part a reaction against a, a technocratic version of modernism, something which was shorn of all of those social and political ambitions that it had. I mean, you could you know go into to Le Corbusier, then you could say, well, he was fairly um, flexible in his politics in any case. Um, but once it became the style of big America, um, once that, that kind of, sort of technocratic planning, separation of pedestrians, separation of living from, uh, from places where people worked, um, what, what they were trying to do was to, to reinvent or to create a, a modern version or a modernist version of the everyday and the ordinary. Um, what, what then happens is that, that that kind of dialogue or that, that language is taken up by other people. And we still talk about every day. We don't tend to describe buildings as ordinary now. We want everything to be iconic. Um, 
so I, you know, I, I, I think I think a lot of this is kind of rhetoric as well. That, that it's, it's in the sort of words that were being used to describe it. Barnabas, can I completely disagree with that? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, um, My role is fulfilled. <laughs> <laughs> you finally started a fight. I've been trying all the way through. Um, so uh, I'm going to get you after. <laughs> um, the uh, in a British context, that's in my view, diametrically wrong. Uh, so um, the, uh, the Smithsons' reaction, the generation of that generation, the, the generation of the Smithsons, uh, the little group around them who give the term brutalism, bring the term new brutalism into being, uh, their architecture is a reaction against their immediate predecessors and a call back to the 1920s and 30s, uh, particularly the 20s. This and is the, the extreme, Smithsons here. That this is the Smithsons at. School at Hans Danson, uh, which is um, splendidly tough. Thank you. It's a very useful thing to have up. Um, uh, described by one person who quite liked it as looking as though it uh, had a promise of canings and theoretical physics on the <laughs> upper floor, um, but uh, because it's so severe and tough. <laughs> Um, but the, reason, the thing they're reacting against is the compromising softness of the immediate post-war generation of modernist architects who are, by and large, um, local government and national government architects producing architecture with a really serious political commitment to the point where a lot of them are card-carrying communists and a lot of them are non-card-carrying communists but still with huge sympathy with Russia with USSR and producing this kind of um, socialist, realist housing with pitched roofs, um, people's detailing as it gets mockingly called, uh, where you have nice little brick details around the doors and things. And that is the, uh, the softening of the 1920s modernism that the Smithsons and co are reacting against. And their reaction is aesthetic and uh, in fact capitalist against the communist older generation, because what they're fighting for is the ongoing existence of small private practices run for profit uh, and with the massive artistic, potentially self-indulgent freedoms of private practice, which I think they were right to argue for, because when you look at the extreme cases of system building taking over entire nations, you get not only um, boringness in the landscape, but you also get things like uh, the panel acts of, uh, of Russia all coming to the end of their safe engineering life at the same time, and suddenly um, millions of people's housing is under structural threat in parts of the former USSR, uh, whereas because our housing system is messy, a few blocks were problematic and have gone, a few blocks were unproblematic and have gone, and the rest remain. Uh, but we don't have that same everybody doing the same thing. But if you look at the Hertfordshire Schools movement, which is the absolute cutting edge of 1940s architecture in this country, it's so much more actually ideologically engaged and so much more actually uh, concerned with the morality of architecture than the Smithsons and their generation ever were, which is why the Hertfordshire schools are fantastically exciting intellectually and uh, the Smithsons and their generation uh, are much better to look at because they cared much more what it looked like. Penny? Yeah, I mean... I'm afraid I'm with Barnabas on, on, on this. Um, yes, so this image um, connects back to the previous image, which was Mies van der Rohe standing by, I think it's an image of him in Crown Hall. This generation of people that gave, uh, that produced the work, which took on the name, which Rainer Bannon gave them of being a brutalist or new brutalists, uh, this generation were like the punks if you like, of, of the age, they were incredibly energetic and passionate, and they were against the sort of fuzzy compromise, as they saw it, of the London uh, City um, Architects Department, which they saw as trying to take the spirit and the energy and the vitality of modernism and reduce it to something that William Morris would have loved. Uh, in other words, that it was cottagey and picturesque and, and everything else. So. That's where, the, that's where the idea of brutalism comes from. And I think that spirit is incredibly architecturally rich. And it's rich because it draws on the tradition of both Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe in the pre-war period. It's not wrong Agreed. to in the in the pre-war period. And it's not wrong to say sorry about the history debate, but it's not <laughs> it's not wrong to say, of course, that they were also critical of some of the things in terms of planning, um, which just actually, sorry, can I just, which brings you to that last slide, which is the images that the Smithsons did for Golden Lane, just around the corner, the, the competition for that, in which they pioneered this idea of 
uh, introducing to Britain Streets in the Sky, which again was in incredibly uh, radical at the time, and I think is you know, something worth uh, identifying with. But even they were caught in the same trap because their big preoccupation in that period became how do we get people to associate. So they very quickly went from energetic and pioneering to being social engineers as well. And that was the problem with the... This is what I'm saying about trap. The problem with the streets in the sky was not an architectural problem. It was that anybody that was operating in this period became an employee of the welfare state at some level and was part and parcel of a process of taking on the whole process of doing everything in largely working class areas, which was not useful. And when it got to the 1970s and 80s, it meant that those areas were literally traps for people because they couldn't move, at, move out of them. So I'm not saying that an architectural style is a trap, but that moment became, became a trap for people. Okay, I'm going to take John in one second, but just to say, uh, we've heard that uh, architects use lots of metaphor and, and signs and so on. To use one metaphor, this is your last opportunity to throw a lump of concrete at anything <laughs> that you've heard today. So I'm going to ask you for any final things that anybody here wants to ask or say uh, before I get the panel to wind up. Uh, in a second, but John's sorry. Yeah, can I can I discussion. come in on this? Um, yeah, as please. being an owner of a self in, a self indulgent private practice, I would like to uh, <laughs> react to some of this. We need to get over ourselves. We are not an ideologically engaged society at the moment. We are certainly not ideologically engaged architectural community at the moment. We're not socially engaged, and we need to you know, sort this out. We are not run by the state. Our, you know, we've devolved all responsibility in part or in full to the private sector to sort all our mess out, and it doesn't work. So we've got to change something, and hence why I think brutalism is really important to look at the characteristics of it. it, it to me, it's not about the style. It can't be about the style. There needs to be something completely different, but fundamentally, we've got to look at some of the great things that were going on there, because at the moment, it does not work. We're going to look back at this period in 20 or 30 years time and go, oh, those lovely glass buildings. Why are we in these you know, concrete huts with small windows? Wasn't that a beautiful period where the veneer of glass could be replaced in 20 years? It's all going to be complete bollocks. We've got to start thinking socially and engaging with people and understanding what we actually want to do. And architects have to be at the front, forefront of that. And at the moment, we are not. Hi. Um I think to Penny, um, you said how the building in Glasgow, the, um, when it was built, was part of um, like the post-war optimism, but now you said the light show was very gothic, and this lady over here said they want to keep the derelict and decay as part of the building. And do you think if brutalism were to come back, instead of preaching optimism, it would kind of preach kind of decay and almost pessimism as a reaction to how a lot of people feel about the state of our country and maybe lack of culture in the country at the moment. Before I came to this talk, I thought I knew what brutalism was, um, but apparently the, the Barbican's not brutalist, um, other things are not brutalist, there are all exceptions to brutalism. And, and then you showed me that slide, the previous one, of the Smithson thing, and apparently that, that is brutalist. Um, and before I came, if you'd said to me, is that brutalist, I would have said no. Yeah. So, simple question for the whole panel, perhaps the sum up. Could you just tell me what brutalism is? <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful question. Just returning on the last point um, that I think John made on the left, uh, that sort of rallying call to change the architecture for more kind of social housing. How do you think that's um, a possible feature in the post-Brexit uh, right-wing government we have at the moment? Good. OK, so uh, return to Brexit. I'm always thinking about um, psychological well-being. As psychologists, I actually think, you know, what kind of impact does this style of architecture have on, you know, how people feel, ultimately, rather than, you know, what kind of values it's associated with? OK, good. All right, so I'm going to ask you for final comments. Um, so Barnabas is very keen that I uh, respond to the point where... 
Um, it, as, as, as a brutalist building in East London was being uh, emptied uh, in order that it could be uh, redeveloped by a property developer and sold off privately, what on earth is an arts trust doing uh, moving into the temporary housing in that point? And I think in a way that kind of, uh, that in a way tells you a lot about the moment. But basically, you know, a bunch of artist studio providers doing something expedient at a time when there's some uh, houses available temporarily that you can use for six months at all with absolutely no rights to tenancy, that that becomes the, the kind of housing crisis in East London when we utterly ignore the failure to build new houses at their millions in order for London to grow. And I feel it was that kind of sentiment that Erno Goldfinger, when he built Balfron Tower, uh, was engaging with. And I think that that kind of thinking is entirely absent today. And so the kind of art washing uh, discussion, which is interesting and fair enough in and of itself, but just like Balfron Tower is a monument that stands alone and is almost divorced from the whole of the skyline, that all of these discussions are utterly divorced from uh, the failure to engage with the idea of what kind of housing we will provide uh, for Londoners and indeed for East Londoners uh, in the context uh, that, we, uh, that, that we face today. Just a couple of observations uh, on, on Balfron. Before the building was topped out in 1967, there was an explosion at another block of flats a mile down the road at Ronan Point, uh, in which the poor housing uh, construction standards of the time uh, you know, came to grief and, the, and, and a large part of the tower block collapsed. And I think that that kind of association of poor construction, failure to invest, combined with that concentration of social problem that Barnabas uh, describes so well, that that in a way describes a moment at which the promise of the post-war period failed. And I think that our uh, kind of cultural attitude towards brutalism gets uh, wrapped up in that moment. But two things I would say. You know, yes, there's the whole thing about the physicality of the concrete, and we like physicality, don't we, today, in a time when, you know, when the digital world and this idea of flows that we can never touch and, you know, the, the internet gets closed down last night, you know, so we like things that we can touch. We like the concrete as much as some people like their beards, it's that kind of uh, physicality. But I think that when you look at what was so brilliant about Erno Goldfinger, actually, it was his obsession with light. You know, over and over and over again, looking at how the light would come into his building and, you know, his obsession with detail, you know, the, the little curve uh, that connects the, you know, the, the line out of the edge of the room in order that you can clean it effectively, the beautiful use of space. Echoed again in Lucy's comments about the thinking about the walkway, the preparedness to uh, experiments, all seem to me to be uh, associated with the architecture of that, that period. And so my question to each of you, when you say anything that you want to, is what would you take you know, that was inspirational of that moment that you would reinvigorate today. So it might not be to do with the concrete, but it could be to do with some of those uh, values that were expressed uh, in the architecture of that period. Anything at all that you want to say, Barnabas? Okay, uh, could I start with a historical pedantry about Ronan Point? It was an exceptionally badly built block, which is why it fell down. They then did extremely careful checks on the entire national stock of high-rise uh, and found very little that needed help because actually it was a period of exceptionally good building standards by and large and we judge its building failures exceptionally harshly because they're recent and often under-maintained uh, whereas Victorian building failures are put down to age now even though some of them uh, Gillespie Kidd and Coyer did leaky roofs uh, Alexander Greek Thompson did roofs that just were always going to give everyone a shower in the 1850s and they're beautiful buildings but they're totally terrible roof designs for rainy Glasgow and he's lionized and nobody cares anymore that he did leaky roofs. 
uh, definition of brutalism, uh, the, there are two definitions at least, uh, two main clusters of definition active, one of which is the new brutalism, and it's the 1950s movement of this sort of thing, which is declared by the architects themselves as a movement name for a group of people. It's a reaction against something called the new humanism, and it's a deliberately radical sounding title. Uh, then there's a period when there's no, not much discussion of brutalism, and then it gets applied externally to a lot of 1960s and 70s buildings that are characterized by extremely heavy use of concrete or an aesthetic consonant with that. So the brick bits of the Barbican don't need to be de-brutalismized just because they're brick. They're clearly part of a brutalist complex. Finally, you ask what I would want people to take away from brutalism. Any architect, I would like you to take away from brutalism the fact that it is a very, very carefully targeted response to the specific conditions of the day, which were big public projects uh, with a very high energy level available getting constantly cheaper. And architecture today has mostly not got its head around the need to reverse that and become very low energy in its heart rather than just in some things you add to it. So people are still designing modernist buildings, and modernism is about use of lots of energy. Uh, but they're then putting blinds on the outside and solar panels on the roof. And it needs to be rethought in a much more fundamental way so that it's not involving loads of concrete in the first place. Uh, the materials are thought about as well. And uh, that's something that some architects are doing, but most architects haven't really got to grips with at all. Okay, Lucy. Okay, your point there about whether brutalism would now be uh, pessimistic, um, and also to bring in uh, John's suggestion about what um, we're going to do um, about the housing crisis, is there going to be ideology involved, or how, uh, or how are we going to think about it? With the particular example of the Barbican Chamber and Town and Bonn were very against the idea of the garden suburb and that's really what they were trying to do here to make a high density city alternative. They thought the idea of the garden suburb was very kind of stultifying and um, a terrible waste of the landscape. Um, as uh, you were mentioning, the, um, in fact a lot of those early kind of garden city ideas, uh, many of the planners and the architects were communist, uh, lots of them had radical ideas and um, this idea that a sort of garden city is just uh, twee and pretty and brutalism is, is strong and urban is a bit too um, extreme. In fact, in a lot of those garden suburbs, you have a lot of the very experimental architects of the 20th century trying out um, small-scale individual houses as well on interesting collisions like, for instance, in Romford Garden Suburb, which does exist, there is um, a house by Tecton next to um, a, a sort of much more traditional Victorian style um, House. So there are these uh, radical interventions in that kind of um, environment, and um, if what we're going to have uh, is uh, new garden cities and garden villages, which is apparently um, what the government says we want at the moment, rather than um, anything like the mass housing um, projects, 1960s, then there needs to be space for those uh, those radical ideas, perhaps new brutalist architects trying things that. Um, in a smaller scale there as well to bring new ideas into those environments so it's not a, um, a sort of suffocating garden suburb, uh, which I think nobody wants and the brutalists certainly didn't want. Okay, very quickly, I think the one thing I'd like people to take, architects, and especially clients, is we live in very timid times and this period, 1950s, 1960s, wasn't. Um, I think we missed an opportunity. Usually uh, recession is good for architecture because nothing gets built, so everyone has lots of time to think about it. Um, our response this time around has been pop-up, um, which is not brave. Um, it's interesting, um, but not brave. So I would just say, and it's more for clients than for architects. Architects, would, would, I'm sure most would, would love kind of the opportunities which people like Chamberlain, Bond and Powell had. Um, just be brave. Okay, thank you very much. Penny? Okay, um, if I was to think of a building that characterises the contemporary period in the line that you said, what, what, what we imagine that a new brutalism might mean now, it would be work by Peter Zumthor. I don't know whether people in the audience know Peter Zumthor, the Swiss architect, just <clears throat> um, was lecturing in, in Scotland and London, I think, last week. He produced a building which is my student's favourite building, and basically it's um, a wigwam of timbers which he um, stacked up together and then wrapped in a box of concrete 
And then he burnt the timbers from the inside so that you've got the memory of the timber uh, imprinted on the inside of the concrete. And, and from the outside, it's just a very solid block. And my students absolutely love this building. It's a, it's a sort of chapel, so it's kind of appropriate. It's not inappropriate. But to me, that really gives me a sense of where we are at the moment in terms of architectural taste and ambition, that it's quite low and that we really love things that are raw and slightly mystical. We have real difficulty thinking about um, things that are rational and address real social problems. And the thing that I would take from these guys in the 50s is that um, they weren't interested in the raw, they were interested in developing a language that was absolutely for its time, which was solving problems, but was also architecturally rich in, in, in ideas. And um, there's a brilliant essay that I recommend to people by Sylvia Lab Levin called The Raw and the Cooked, in which she explains our contemporary obsession with the, raw, the rawness of things and suggests that it's a, step, a cultural step backwards and a, and a rejection of progress. And I think that by looking at these guys, we can remember what progress is about in relation to architecture. Thank you, Penny. John. Um, just coming back to you know, what, is, uh, you know, what is brutalism and what do I take from it? I'm always fascinated that you know, we're obsessed with the word ism. And that's why I thought I'd put forward Brexitism, because I have no idea what that means either. I think <laughs> brutalism in itself is really, you know, it's, it's defining a period of time, just like Victorian it, you know, defines a period of time. But what I, I find interesting is, and it's been said on the panel, it's a reaction to a specific condition. At the moment, I genuinely think we're in an evolving specific condition. And that's why I genuinely think that we should be defining that specific condition now. I think we should be reacting and reacting with energy. And I think, above all, it's this idea of honesty and integrity within the brutalist buildings, that I, I genuinely think there's something interesting because a lot of the uh, contemporary buildings that are going up now don't, don't have that. You know, some of it is you know, far too commercial. And I say that as a self-indulgent private practitioner. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just ask everybody to give a great big thank you to the panel here today.